Hello, I'm Ron Miscavige, and this is Life After Scientology. And by the way, that song, that little bit of an intro there we played, is a song called Sicily. It's one of the songs on the album I did in 1974 in England. And um, I thought I'd have a, a pretty theme for our guest, who's a pretty individual, so I played a pretty theme. Now, first of all, before we get into the interview itself, I just want to thank a new Patreon, uh, Henny Sinkoff, $2, and I thank you very much, Henny. Uh, it's very much appreciated. And for those of you who don't know exactly what I'm talking about, it's your way to contribute to the ongoingness of this show. We have a thing called Patreon. If you go on my website, therealronmiscavige.com, it'll show you how to join, and you can contribute a dollar or two or five or ten or a hundred, whatever you want to. And uh, that helps keep us going because, as I've mentioned many times, I don't have a sponsor. And my main reason for not wanting a sponsor is I don't want anybody telling me what I can or can't do. What this show is, is a way for somebody to come on here and tend to tell their whole story. You won't be thrown under the bus. I'm not going to interject anything counter to what you're saying. I give you the full opportunity to tell your story. And if you want to help in this, join, become a Patreon. And you'll, you'll actually feel better for doing it because... You're, you're doing something about it, and we're exposing the abuses of Scientology. And later on, as the show goes on, take up different cultures. You're going to see the similarity in them. So anyway, getting, getting into our guest this morning, uh, I know this uh, individual for geez, decades, and we go back a long time. <laughs> I was going to introduce her as a false name. The hell with it. I'm not going to do it. Hey, this is a very special first person a very highly trained individual uh, in the techniques and uh, technology of Scientology and a very successful businesswoman. Please welcome Karen de la Courier. Good morning, Karen. Hi, Ron. Hi. It's so rare. And you, you got an opportunity to tell your story. So what I would like to do to kick it off is this. And I don't know if you ever told this because I know you've done interviews in the past, but could you just tell how you got started in Scientology? What, what got you going in it? Oh, it's kind of a boring thing. It's well, I so had a, I had a boyfriend and he was really into it in London. His name was Barry Fairburn. He said, if you want to have a relationship with me, you got to do Scientology. Next thing is I was holding soup cans, empty soup cans. And I kid you not, somebody was screaming down the corridor, stand up to an ashtray. And I thought, wow. <laughs> that was my first view of Scientology. Um, I, I kept going. I kept going. You know, it, it's so rare that you meet someone in the 1970s, like you and I did, yeah. early 1970s. And 40 years later, you interview with them nice. on the screen. Wow, we have known each other decades. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you. Yeah. And look, you were in for 40 years. Yeah. How, how come so long before leaving? Just, I'm curious. Oh, Ron, you know, was it Simon and Garfunkel the song? A man believes what he wants to believe and disregards the rest, right? I wanted it to work. I yep. wanted it. I wasn't there to make it wrong. I was there to see how can this be right? Yeah. So I observed as the years went by and it became worse and worse and worse. I don't know. Did I have a brain aneurysm? When I look back on it, when it, once you're out of the tunnel, you really shake your head in disbelief. Well, I'll summarize why 40 years. If you have a frog in boiling, if you throw a frog in boiling water with its hind legs, it would jump out in a New York second. But what if you have the frog slowly, slowly turning up the water on a very slow, gradual way. 
that frog gets used to the hot water in such a gradient that by the time it's boiling, he's kind of gotten, gotten used to it. Um, and Scientology did progressively get worse. It wasn't that bad in the 70s. Would you agree with that? Karen, I agree with you 100%. And I'm telling you, a lot of people that I interview agree with me and you. It was a different scene. It was a different scenario. It was like a country club, practically. Yep. You can't, it was loosey-goosey. You came and went and had, you know, just... But, um, yeah. So, my frog analogy is why I say... Now, there's an addendum to this. My son, Alexander Jench, who died at 27, and the cult have blood on their hands on his death, um, he was in the Sea Org, and that was a holder. I knew if I departed, they would hold him against me. So the last 20 years after I left the Sea Organization in 1990 and only departed the cult in 2010, those last 20 years were to prevent losing my son. So it was only really 20 years that I put up with it. The other 20 years was, am I willing to lose my one and only child by departing? You, you know how it is, the emotional blackmail. Yeah, absolutely. You, is, it, is it you departed and you can't see your own grandchildren? Yeah. No, I tell you, I... I can't see them. I can't see my great grandchildren. I don't even know how many I have. It's that bad. Wow. Mm. Yeah. But anyway, what what gave you the wake up call finally to say the hell with you? I had two very bad bad incidents, which threw me into a turmoil and really made me think hard of what am I doing with my life. One was a punishment to run around a pole called the running program. And it happened because I was opposing the absolute greed and lust for money at the flight land base, where in 1980, 1981, 1982, the cult of Scientology would allow anybody, as long as they had cash, to come to the flag land base for counseling and claim that the class 12 HGC, the highest HGC, would crack their case. In other words, unravel all their baggage and yeah, now, Karen, just let me interrupt you for a second. You mentioned Class 12 and HGC. Oh, Why don't you right. Explain that to our audience, okay? Because I think that's an interesting point because we're talking about, <clears throat> as far as race car drivers, people who would win the Indianapolis 500. They don't race in, in local stockyards, okay? Could, yes. If you could explain that, I'd appreciate it. And I think our listeners would too. Scientology is always levels. They call it a bridge, higher, 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 higher. And class 12 is the highest level of training in that entity. I mean, class 12 means absolutely nothing to me, or, <laughs> but it was higher and higher levels, getting tougher and tougher to obtain with brutal internships. So class 12 was the top of the pinnacle. The HEC was simply the delivery area, Hubbard Guidance Center. That was the delivery area where people paid a lot of money to get counseling. To sit in front of me was $1,000 an hour, $1,000 an hour to have my presence asking about your, your case, your baggage, your aberrations, whatever. And 
we were booked wall to wall. I mean, I would have four to five people on my lineup. And that was in the class 12 HEC. Then I got promoted to be the class 12 case supervisor. That meant all the class 12s were under me for handling, for jurisdiction, for, super, for supervising each case. When I was the class 12 case supervisor, flag was the complete opposite of what it is today. Today, if you arrive and they find out you even thought of suicide, you had a flash thought for five seconds, you are immediately sent to temper org and offloaded as a security risk. But in my day, it was brutal. The greed for money to have, I call flag the whole entity there that takes your money and delivers counseling or training. That's called flag in Clearwater. Right. Well, the, if somebody got an inheritance and the salespeople smelled a lot of cash, boom, they extorted the money and you were sent to flag and you landed in my domain. The class now, twelve. Question, before you go on, because we're right, we're right back. When you audited people, when you sat down with them and they held the cans and they were being audited up you, how many hours a week would you do that? Would you say? Fifty hours a week. How many? Fifty. Fifty was my average. Fifty hours a week so in the church. You were earning fifty thousand dollars for that institution. Correct. And how much would you get paid? <laughs> Well, in those days, we would get $25 a week. Oh, that's fair. What the hell? You know, you give me 50000 I give you 25 bucks. you know? <laughs> that's like Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies. You know what I'm saying here? We did get our food, meals, and uh, a bunk bed in a, in a dorm. But if you were married, you got a room with a husband. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, that's... Okay, listen... So let's get back to you, you were talking about when it, this changed your mind. You were down there. You remember you were bringing that up? Oh. You said you were running around the pole because you disagreed. Because right. of, uh, I was yeah. running around a pole because I opposed the greed where suicidal cases, cases that had just come off heroin with blank memory, were dumped in my area for me to do a miracle, a Benihana or a, uh, what are these televangelists? I was supposed to do a miracle on a, on a person that really belonged in uh, an a facility or an institution, some psychiatric facility. But because the flag wanted money so much, I mean, people would arrive and threaten that they would throw themselves off the crystal ball, the balcony out the 12th floor onto oh. the cement. And I was supposed to be this miracle, brilliant person that could solve anything. And I fought it. I opposed it. And I was deemed as cutting across GI lines, cr cutting across revenue, cash, they wanted to make a million dollars a week and I was being noisy. So I was summoned to, <laughs> do you remember someone called Int Finance Ethics Officer, Don Larson? Of course they do. All right. So Don Larson summoned me and I thought, what? I have nothing to do with finance. I'm a, tech, I'm a techie. Kept me waiting outside his room two hours, called me in and said, Karen, you're going to the RPF. And I said, I want to see the documentation on what I've done. He said, oh, no, 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 no. you're not going in the RPF, you're going on the RPF. <laughs> Till you've had a comment, no one can go straight to the RPF. You have a committee of evidence and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, long story short, I like to synopsize and not talk. It becomes a monologue. I, I like you and I go back and forth more. Long story yeah. is, 
I went to the RPF and in the RPF, the first thing they said was I was to run around a pole 12 hours a day, 12 hours a day. Wait, Karen, uh, was, was this that flag you did it? Yes, flag, flag. Where was the pole? I, I'm familiar with the area and I can't imagine. Yeah. They had a park right down. You went down, drew a long ways, Drew Avenue, and the, and then you turned left, and there was a sort of a deserted little park, and they um, they put up a pole there, and <laughs> then the the St. Pete Times, wait, no, not the St. Pete, the Clearwater Sun, which is no longer even in existence, the Clearwater Sun did a huge front page. They are killing the grass. We were running around on the park. And so they moved us to another place, which was like, anyway, it was torture. Yeah. You're asking why did I, what, what made, gave me the wake up call? Doing the running program was a huge wake up call. Okay. First of all, it was against my will. And one principle, Scientology looks so good on paper, all these nice doctrines. What they say in the doctrine and what they actually do are 180 degree in reverse. One basic, basic cardinal law in the doctrines is you never force a person to do any kind of counseling, auditing, anything over a big upset called an ARC break. I was violently upset, but I was forced to keep doing this over my huge upset at the enforcement. Wow. So with swollen ankles and knees, I hobbled a lot. You you can't run. I, I hadn't trained for marathon running from from no training to 12 hours a day running. That's unbelievable, actually. It was torture. It was absolute torture. And I, but I was married to Heba, the president of the Church of Scientology International at the time. Yeah. And uh, so now I was also locked in through a marriage. Anyway, for months in my life, about three months, I had this torture. And the wake up call was what am I doing with my life? Yeah. What have I signed up for? Now, remember, well I, I, I had not done crimes. They did three committees of evidence on me. Two of them sent me right back on post saying <laughs> there was no crime. There was no charge. I was a blah, 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 blah. But you know, in the kangaroo courts of Scientology, if seniors want to nail you, yeah. they'll just call another committee of evidence and not accept. I mean, there's no such thing as justice there. It's a donkey Listen, kangaroo in, court. <laughs> in 42 years of me being involved, I never saw any justice of any of me involved in a committee of evidence. In other words, if they wanted to make you guilty, they called a comment. Yes, yes. I agree. I absolutely agree. Did you ever have a comment? Yeah, and I was found guilty every time, no matter what. <laughs> I mean, you might as well say, look, we're going to calm of you. I, and I'll say, okay, I'm guilty. Yeah, you're guilty. Okay, good. Fuck the calm of. Let's just get on with it. <laughs> it was that way. I mean, I was, I was and running for 12 hours a day. God damn it, man. How could you melt? Just for your global audience, calm of is court martial. Calm yeah. of is internal slang, meaning. A group of like a jury is going to listen to all the facts. And by the way, they solicit when you have a court martial or called comment, they solicit everybody to write up a report on you. Yeah. So anybody who's had a beef on you who wants vengeance, they pile write, on. They pile on. It's a pile. Yep. On. It's oh, a yeah. Pile. So there you go. That's the sanity so, of the committee so, of evidence. Let's celebrate. That, okay. So that was number one wake up call. The right. second one was at in base. <laughs> Ron, you did something special. You, you probably won't remember it. You won't remember it. Anyway, I had a two year old son in Los Angeles. My son who's passed Alexander Jench, 
and Hema were sent to Germany because Germany was blowing up the country did not want Scientology in. They found a lot of things wrong. They found a lot of Germans um, complaining about money ripoff and bankruptcies and so on. So Heber was in Germany and I was sort of kidnapped or held hostage. I was not allowed to leave. In I wasn't in pay staff, but I was ordered by your son, David Miscavige, summoned there and I was there for six months but I, let me tell a little anecdote you were dar you were darling you were darling I came out of Del Sol black wait a minute for the audience Del Sol was the name of a building there just so you know what she's you know excuse me well I meant to yeah. interrupt her, not excuse yeah. me no 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 I'm glad you did came yeah. out of that building with all grass and trees and you saw me looking looking when i say black when a person is completely utterly caved in the universe has collapsed the world has collapsed there they're the size of a dot <laughs> and you saw me but you'd known me in earlier times and you'd seen me in higher times giving oh, speeches yeah. i went around the world giving speeches i had i was well known and um you saw me and you gave me a hug and you said, come on, come on, nothing lasts that long or whatever, so something to do with there is calm after a storm, get through it and come out the other end. It was just some, and you know, you were, you were David Miscavige's father. You had a whole view of the way Sea Org members looked at you and viewed you. You were the father of the top of the food chain. <laughs> there was nobody, <laughs> there was nobody that could challenge or wave at David Miscavige in, in, in a way he didn't like. So getting a hug from you had much bigger significance than you thought or realized did you know did you know about this little uh, incident you mentioned it to me priorly but I, I appreciate you saying that too but let me tell you something karen i never in my life i mean from a little child growing up felt that if a person was down you would help them by kicking them when they were down mm -hmm. i always felt that if you could just show them a little bit of love or kindness or encouragement it's going to help them yeah. Where you kick them when they're down, you're contributing to the idiots that made that person get in that position. Okay, and uh, no, it, it, and usually it, uh, there's a bunch of idiots because you know birds of feather flock together, so they want to make nothing of you. They're gonna make a little dot, like a little spot on the pavement. And I knew you, and I knew you were a powerful being and a, a brilliant person, and. Uh, I just felt I'd give you a little encouragement, and I appreciate you. What a, what a, what a lovely thing to say that you 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 give a, when someone's down, you give them that. That's a, that's a nice thing that shows your good heart. That shows your good heart. That there's just even though Scientology scream in the law courts, they're a religion, church, church, church. Would you agree with me, Ron? That there is no mercy, no kindness. Nothing is benign. It's all clobber with a stick. It's all yeah. domination. Do you it agree? Is, yeah. Tell me. Tell me your thought on that. On, no, on no, nothing kind. You just gave. You just gave a wonderful little blurb of the kindness in your heart to someone who's down. Don't get me wrong. I've done things in my life that I'm not proud of, and uh, I'll admit them. And uh, but that's one thing I've, I've always believed in because when somebody would do it for me, I know I always felt better and I figured I'd return it to other people. But in getting back to what you said about the church, the main thing about it is this, there's no compassion in it. And mm -hmm. if you look at any religion, regardless of their downfall, of, I mean, of, of their faults and everything, you'll find some bit of compassion in it. And that's mm -hmm. what makes them last. Whereas if there's no compassion, 
you know, you end up drinking uh, cyanide like uh, Jim Jones. Was that a religion or was it just a cult? <laughs> cult. Jim you know, Jones cult. He had no compassion. That's the end of it, you know. Anyway. Not only, not only no compassion. Uh, if you have fallen in disgrace, people avoid even looking at you. I They'll know. pass you. <laughs> Ooh, the rest of the group just shun you. You're you're bad. You're you they'll, they'll all run the party line. They they do the politically correct thing, and what I mean by that is wanting to look good for David Miscavige or any of the senior executives. They want to look good in their eyes, regardless of what their actions mean in the actual physical universe. Anyway, go on. So, so, so two things gave me the wake up call to leave. One was the running program and that threw me into complete doubt. It was torture. It was, uh, uh, and you know what? After six months, Ron, six months in this RPF is a gulag. It's a prison camp. It's where you go for severe punishment. Yeah five hours of heavy manual work a day and five hours of more indoctrination uh, that was that threw my whole world upside down that was that but i stayed on i was married to heber but this summoning me to in base this six months was just married to heber or not i couldn't i couldn't know i I stayed on a bit more and yeah. But mentally you probably had yeah. would you say that? Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah. So it's a it's not a religion because it thrives on punishment. It's management by punishment. It's management by domination. Even though the original claims are to lift you higher spiritually, it actually is there with fear factors to put you in a tunnel and contain you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they want to use leverage on you. Like, uh, now, when Alexander died, were you, were you ever fair gamed about him, as they say? Yeah, yeah. First of all, he died, and the cult I had w contributed to for 40 years and worked on staff for 20 years didn't even have the decency to call me to let me know his dead body was lying in the morgue. I got a Facebook message from a stranger who was a stranger then. He's a friend now, Aaron Smith Lovin. Facebook messaged me and said, Karen, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but Alexander's dead. Wow. And I thought, wow, this is, this is a Facebook stranger. And I thought, they must mean Heber. Heber's, you know, in his late 70s now. It couldn't be. Alexander's 27 years. You don't go to bed. 27 years old and wake up dead the next morning <laughs> yeah. anyway Jeffrey and I we called the coroner and everything and it was Alexander and it was wow um, how did it lead up to his death give us a little details about that because this this is astonishing that he would die at 27 years old what what led to this was he in well, at the time or was he out or what Ron, first of all, he died of pneumonia. A $20 antibiotic could have saved his life. But he wasn't, he was forced and manipulated against me because by now I was speaking out. I was on blogs, I was telling inside horror stories. He and his wife got, had a, his wife got pregnant and she was enforced to abort. She had to have an abortion. Right. She couldn't get over it. She got pregnant two years later. And by now, Claire Headley and Mark Headley had sued and Laura Dickman had sued and the abortions became really, really hot all over the web. So the cult stopped this enforced abortion 
coerced abortion technique. That was tactic was stopped. They would do it more gently, more sweetly. They never, they still do it to this day. People are gently, gently told, you know, it's not the greatest good for the greatest number of dinah, blah, blah. Anyway, Alexander had exited the CO because his wife was pregnant. And the last two years of his life, he was non CO. He got pneumonia and did not have, he kept having chest pains and he took opioids and he took prescription drugs, not, not street drugs, but he took drugs. And the way I say the cult had blood on his hands is because, you know me, I'm pretty affluent. I oh, could yeah. have had the best medical treatment for him. He would have had a full diagnosis, but he was completely manipulated by the cult to not to, to, to be disconnected from me. Where, so, where was he staying when this happened? What was the story on that? He went to Dallas, Fort Worth to work for a Scientologist who had given big money to the church. It was a finance area thing. He was there when he first got pneumonia. He traveled to Los Angeles and he stayed with his in-laws and did a cocktail of these painkillers and died. This and is, this is absolutely astonishing. I'll tell you, man, it just, it is beyond the beyond. Well, here's a guy who did eight, 16, 18 years of his life in the sea organization. He had done three purification rundowns and grew up in a culture that was anti-drug and yet killed himself of drugs. Wow. Uh, three purifs, so much for their purification rundown. Three purification rundowns, you're supposed to have cognitions to not do drugs. <laughs> yeah. And he killed himself on drugs. He was reporting to OSA every week. Every week he had to check in. He was run by them. They wanted to be so sure that he wasn't hooking up with me. Now, the cult that would not spend one dime, and, and Heber, his father, all this time was in the hole. I'll let you describe the hole, Ron. Well, I like back and forth. Yeah, okay, the whole, this was a, an aberration that was dramatized by the senior officials. It was two trailers that were hooked up together. And when they did this originally, it was going to be the headquarters for the Commodore's Messenger Org. And uh, this is like senior management of Scientology. And that was a temporary place for them to stay until buildings were built that they would be housed in very posh quarters <clears throat> well what happened is i guess david came up with the idea that he was going to change this into a little bit of a we want to call it brainwashing or mind alteration or you know getting a person into good shape and you think they're in bad shape and they turned it into a thing and it was called a hole and what it was was on all the windows there were bars put the doors were screwed shut, literally with screws and bars put across them. And there was one entrance to it. And at that entrance was a security guard who guarded people coming in and coming out. And people were sent there and they spent their entire day confessing their quote unquote sins or their transgressions or how they were trying to uh, manipulate and sabotage everything that David was doing to save the church. And they were trying to bring it down. So in other words, it was presumed that all of these people were suppressive persons. And this was literally all of international management was in there and, and some other people. <clears throat> and uh, that's what it was. It was like a mind alteration unit, because if you didn't come up with enough sins, you just kept on being blasted by everybody else that was there. You started making up things just so you could get them off your back. And this did happen. And once you start going into that delusory state of mind, you start existing in an alternate reality. And that reality is not based on what's true in the physical universe. You are now living in a mindset where you think 
you're so bad, you can't be trusted. And you don't know how you're ever going to get out of this state of mind. And that's the, basically a uh, gerbil. You know where they have these Ferris wheels where they run around on it? That's what you're in at that point. You're never going to get out of something that you're actually not in. But you've made your mind think that you are in this. Now, I don't know if I've made that complicated or maybe simplified it, but that's my description of it. And that's what these people were going through. And as an example, they would march down to lunch together, march back. They would shower in the showers in the garage. It was a hell of an existence. It was just very bad. And if you ever saw anybody and said hello to them, say, hey, Gary, how you doing? They'd say, oh, I'm doing great. I'm really doing great. In other words, this don't say anything that would reflect badly on how you're being treated. Uh, don't let the cat out of the bag. Don't let people know what's going on there. And what was going on there was like uh, in England, there's a place called Bedlam where they put the insane people in. And I'm not saying that all these people were insane, but they were trapped and uh, they were made to think things that weren't true at all about them. And they built their own little mental prisons. And that's... And I don't know how they're ever going to get out of it because that place would have to be torn apart, people taken out, you know, just get some fresh air, get some freedom, get a job, and uh, maybe someday get out of that state of mind. But you, you got to, at one point or another, say, hey, listen, I've been conned. That would be your ticket to freedom, at least to start. So there's my short little summary of the, the whole. That was very good, Ron. That was very good. I, I think that, that instead of asking for sin, they ask for crimes. What crime have you committed on David? Right. What, what are you intending to destroy Scientology? What crimes have you done? <laughs> and well, they, they would, would punch and beat that each other. Sin in any other religion, not a crime, you know. But yeah, they they were. You're right. They were asked, "What crimes have you committed? What are you doing to disestablish everything that good is being happened, and you're trying to tear it down?" Yeah. And they would punch each other. They were it was like sand. It was just just beyond any normal conduct. And this was the hierarchy, the absolute top highest yep. execs of Scientology. Yeah. My ex husband, Heber Gench, who was president of Church Scientology International, lived in this for seven years of his life. Seven years he was in this known as SP Hole. Law enforcement call it the dungeon. Yeah. Anyway, this gulag, Heber was only allowed to see his son 11 times in 17 years. 11 times. Wow. His father was allowed to see him, usually for a two and a half hour Sunday morning slot because he was not permitted by the cult of Scientology to be a father. In fact, Alexander had a chip on his shoulder and called himself the boy, uh, the boy without a dad. He wow. actually called himself that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's terrible. Well, we've gone a little bit yeah. astray here, but let, let me bring us back to what a point I would like to bring up. Now, we didn't see it go astray. This is the whole story. This is, we don't rehearse this before we go on the air. So you're seeing this story come out as it's coming out. Now, did you ever sue the church or did you ever have any? There's something about you, uh, about the church interrupting or interfering in a lawsuit that you had. Oh, what, oh, oh no, 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 no. I did not sue. No, I did not sue the church. I, I was involved in a rather boring, dull litigation to do with real estate, a trust deed. Okay. It was just real, pure real estate. But all su suing anyone is in the law courts. It's public documents. Right. Basically, someone lent, loaned me money for the down payment of my home. And then when Thomas Kincaid died, I'm a Thomas Kincaid art dealer. When Thomas Kincaid died in 2012, I made three quarters of a million dollars in four days. Whoa. The, the reason for that is as he died, 
people wanted some painting of his. I didn't know that death, anytime an artist dies, people run and buy his CD or his autograph picture, whatever. At, at death, I didn't realize death gave a huge boost to sales. Yes, I, I was on multiple channels. Uh, NBC came and put satellites on my roof and interviewed me. Uh, uh, NBC network went nationwide yeah, yeah. on Thomas Kincaid's death. I was, I was made almost a spokesman. So when I made three quarters of a million dollars, the person who lent me 125,000 down payment for this house wanted all set wanted the three quarters of a million dollars alleging that i had <laughs> that it had accrued compound interest so i Jesus sued right that's I the sued. mafia rates <laughs> so i sued and the suit was public knowledge in the in the law courts and scientology operatives co members showed up multiple times to my opponent's counsel saying, we've got dirt on her. We can have dirt. We can let you give the judge dirt on her. We've got, and apparently they took stuff from my confessional PC folders and gave it to opposing counsel. Fair wow. game. Fair game. Uh, the opposing counsel was freaked out. He'd never in all his years of practicing law had some people come in and say, we've got her confessionals. <laughs> Damn it, he didn't take pictures, but he got so bothered with Office of Special Affairs showing up to try and interfere with the lawsuit that he talked to my counsel, his uh, his opposition, and said, "How do I get rid of these people from the cult, from the Church of Scientology? They're showing up every week. They want they want to they they really Karen has enemies. They want to take her out. But um, the f the final straw was <laughs> they said, "Listen, w let us take over the case. We'll get that house of hers. We'll destroy her. We." We want, we let us take over the case and we'll win. And this was really too much. The lawyer thought that they were trying to take his business. He's paid by his client and the yeah. cult is moved. The cult was so driven and so ordered, probably by David Miska. I was a loud, loud voice by now. And I was getting a million views a year. Do you know wow. that my YouTube channel has almost eight million i think it hit over eight million views wow. although i've only been on the air five years so over one million people a year watch my youtube <clears throat> videos this really bothered osa that i was in this million range of people listening to me so that's why they did that they took stuff from my pc folder they told opposing counsel she slept with 50 men from the ages of 18 to 24. And I remember the session where the counselor was saying, well, how many men did you sleep with total? I remember how I was thinking, they're going to use this against me. I mean, I was single. Those were my years of discotheques and so on. This was made out to mean she's promiscuous. She's a slut. She's a this, that. Anyway, a happy ending to this is that <laughs> the lawyer who was fighting my lawyer, opposing counsel, told the judge, your honor, the Church of Scientology is trying to take over the case. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. It was put right in front of the judge. So it, I thought that was really worth it all for the judge to know how dirty the cult could be in vengeance to try to 
uh, it was brought up. Yeah, so, look, it, it, honestly, it doesn't surprise me at all. I'd have to pretend to be surprised to be even saying I'm surprised, all right? But let me ask you this. How did it end up? Did you just pay the guy the money you owed him and you kept the rest? He got a fraction of what he asked for. He got a fraction of what he asked for, but then I he appealed that. He wanted more. He was greedy. Yeah. So he appealed it. Long story short, appeals court awarded me $70,000 legal fees. So if you calculate how much he got minus the 70,000 legal fees, but he then appealed that. I'll tell you, I would be so much more affluent if I didn't have legal bills. I've had five years of legal, never sue anyone, Ron. Oh. Don't sue. The only Lawyers. ones, that make, the only ones yes. that make money are the attorneys. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Oh boy. Uh, legal, we would make money. We would sell for a long while. I was the number one Thomas Kincaid dealer, bar none for a long while. I was untouchable in terms of volume and so on. The, the climate has changed, but I have a mailing list of 30,000, 40,000 people privately who every birthday of their wife, every Christmas time, every anniversary, they come right back to me to buy another time. Thomas Kincaid is addictive. Nobody yeah. walks away and buys only one image of his. Many people have a lot of walls and they buy it. Anyway, yeah. So, so, so fair game uh, on that lawsuit was simply, uh, how low will they go? Every, every single session you ever have is on video and yeah. it's recorded. And everything you ever give in any counseling session in the cult of Scientology, the auditor is handwriting every word you say. Yep. And when you leave, a time track is made out and they will use stuff you've given up in a confessional against you. Yep. So my advice, as well as Karen's advice, I'm sure is this. If you're considering going into the Church of Scientology, beware and don't say somebody didn't warn you they <laughs> will use anything you say against you and there is no mercy no anything if you were to speak out or just utter the wrong words and you declared a suppressive person just get ready for a hate site to be put up on you which thank god i don't give a hoot what the hell they say about me so they can just keep it coming i'm going to keep doing this and keep on having people like karen come on but now let's come to this point and i think this would be interesting for people to hear. <clears throat> you were one of the highest trained uh, auditors and case supervisors in the world under that particular technology of L. Ron Hubbard. Can you summarize what this means and what what is the value of this? Scientology comes down to only two things, two things. They feel they will make you a better, happier human being if you confess your crimes. And it's a runaway train. It's just become endlessly what we call grade two. Grade two is one level where you're supposed to confess what you've done. But yeah. Scientology in its current state is only about confessionals, sex checks, your crimes. Number two, the other part of Scientology is Scientology believes that you are not a single entity. You are not one person. You are a cluster of various attachments of other spirits glummed onto you in your space and attached to your body. So those are the two main principles of Scientology. What are your crimes? confess everything and then from ot3 to ot8 five ot levels is exorcism of plucking out <laughs> plucking out your entities and jettisoning them jettisoning them into the milky way that i've given you 
I, I don't think anyone could summarize Scientology in one sentence. I did it for you. I got Over it. Karen, I... I <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, you, and you blew me away. You blew me away. That is that is the summarization of it. That's actually marvelous. And one million dollars to get to OTA. You get you will you will beg, borrow, steal. You will take out loans, and you will do this to get to OTA, where you are jettisoning out of your space your entities. That's Scientology. I gave it to you in one paragraph. Wow. But we can save a lot of people a million dollars by telling them what it is, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, you probably saved a lot of people a million dollars with that one statement. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody who hears this should become a Patreon because we just saved you a lot of money. So you can contribute to this program going on. But now, talk a little bit about OT8. This is the highest level of spiritual awareness or spiritual advancement. What is it? Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you that it does cost, no question about it, about a million dollars to get to this level. It's a million dollar fee to get here. Now, before I tell you exactly what it is, I'm going to tell you that I personally know of 14 people that had full-blown mental breakdowns known in our lingual type three full-blown mental breakdown institutional level after doing ot8 what does that tell you about reaching the highest level in the cult it could drive I, you nuts <laughs> a huge amount of ot8s walked out of the church after doing it they departed that was they went to buddhism they went on the web, they talked to Tony Ortega. They, another percentage died off of strokes, heart attacks, cancer, diabetes. So much for reaching the top, top level of the cult. Yeah. It's supposed to make you almost supernatural. In actual fact, you die off of a stroke and so on. What is it? Well, I already told you that Five major levels of the cult's doctrines are expelling your spirits that are attached to your body, attached to you. OT8 is a compilation of every identity you've ever brought up in auditing. Let's say you ran a Dianetic session and you said, oh, I was in the Roman Empire and I was a Roman centurion. Well, Roman centurion would be any identity that you've ever mentioned. I went to a graveyard and I thought I saw a ghost. Ghost. Any identity you've ever mentioned is compiled before you start OT8. And then on the session of OT8, you're asked, the Roman centurion, was that you? Was it a BT, meaning an attachment spirit? Or was it a cluster, meaning was it a group of entities attached to you? So basically, OT8 is challenging that what you talked about, was that really you? Or was that one of your entities? And then they ask different, is it true or false, whatever. If it's an entity, they blow the entity, which is just another form of expelling entities. And right at the end, they give a very highly evaluative judgmental statement to you saying, everything you've ever run in every session in all of Scientology, None of that was you. It was all your entities yapping. Everything you've ever done was all BT cluster talk. And this kind of caves in a lot of people. They may have spent 100,000 having three L's, and now they learn that they didn't run the L. It was an attached spirit that was talking to the auditor. I've summarized OT8 for you. 
You look a little surprised, Ron. Well, I'll tell you. It... <laughs> so then you get to the point where you realize everything you've said so far wasn't you. You're basically at the point you were before you ever walked into a Scientology organization. Is that right? That, that's fair. That sums it up. Well, that's worth a million bucks, I would say, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is unreal, but it is true. And uh, let's just go on from there because I don't think we could add a word to that. And anybody who's watching this, maybe you should watch this interview again for these two little pieces because it's very educational as far as I'm concerned. But now... <clears throat> Let me just talk about the cult itself. Okay, Karen? Okay, sure thing. Mm -hmm. They've been around since 1950, basically. Oh. You know, mm -hmm. Scientology, that's Dianetics, Modern Science and Mental Health come out. And they've evolved from in the very beginning, and I, I really do mean this. My early experiences, I, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed doing the communication course. Some of the simple uh, communication I had with an auditor, uh, I, I thought I, I gained from it, but yeah. mm -hmm. that solidified my belief that everything they're going to tell me is going to be true. Mm. So that as I went on and something was introduced to me where I thought, eh, I don't know it. Uh, okay. I'll accept it. All right. So basically I get, they gained my confidence with a nice beginning mm -hmm. and then by that, I was introduced slowly and I accepted all these things. So it's evolved from that, as you mentioned earlier in our interview, being like a country club we went to, to where now they are a cult driven by money, 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 money. Now, over these years, do you think they've become more fierce uh, or more tolerant or, or what? Uh, how, how do you summarize that? What's the condition of this particular entity that we're talking about called the Church of Scientology. And it should be called the Cult of Scientology. I, I think they've radically moved in a polarized fashion to become more and more drastic, more and more punitive. They definitely haven't lightened it up. And that's a big puzzle to me with such worldwide daily exposures, videos, people coming out. I mean, the, the internet, Google, Twitter, Facebook groups, it's just never-ending exposure. And you would think, wow, let's just do some damage control and lighten up a little bit. No, no, it's pendulum swung and become worse by the, by the week, by the hour, by the minute, it's worse. However, their effectiveness to punish you is weaker and weaker. There was a time where if you were declared suppressive person, you were thrown out in the world, you lost everything. Yeah. There were no support groups. Now there's an aftermath foundation, which if you just flee, you've got a whole support to give you a new life, driver's license, uh, open a bank account, give you a job, give you where to stay, food, da, 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 da. there was no such thing in our day, back in our day. You're right. You were, you were hurled into outer space with nothing, absolutely nothing. So their effectiveness in terms of OSA vengeance, their teeth have been sharpened down, their claws are weaker. I love the way you said a little while ago, I don't give an F. They yeah. can make hate pages on me. You were you you have the attitudes that, that that's a great attitude. If their design is to get in your head, if you don't allow them to get in your head, do you, do you know they sent a private investigator to my home yeah. uh, two days ago? Two days ago. Really? Asking to speak to me. Yeah about the Leah Romani show, they're little, 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 little. Jeffrey did a nice bull bait of this and there's a wonderful essay coming out 
<laughs> Tony Ortega's vlog. Anyway, they sh I've never shown up at one of their churches. You know, I live walking distance from, course, yeah. from the big complexes and celebrity. I've never shown up, but they show up at my door. Well, they, they will pay a penalty for that. This is one of the penalties they're paying. Some of the juicy stuff I gave you. I feel it's wrong. How dare they show up at my private residence? Well, but I can, I'll, I'll give you some advice. When they show up, you should reward them with your Russian wolfhound greeting them at the door. <laughs> I don't know if you'd be that anxious to show up, okay? Because that dog, if he likes you, he's a wonderful little pooch. Well, not little, it's like a mini pony. And if I saw that dog, I would say, okay, see you later, Karen. <laughs> he really liked you on your last visit here. Oh, I remember. those pictures that we took of He really liked you. In the bedroom, and I feel this, like his breath, and there's a dog looking at me. And then he walked <laughs> out of the room. He came in the room and checked me out, you know? <laughs> All right. Well, listen. Uh, how, do you feel you've told your story? I I'm, I'm, want to make sure we got all the points covered, Karen. Ron, this Scientology is an encyclopedia. It's never, I'd love you to invite me back. I've got tons of juicy oh. anecdotes. Let's do a part two, but this is a great part one, and you were a great host. I you thank you very were. much. Thank you. Listen, Karen, I will lean on you on that promise because this, your summarization of Scientology and OTA just blew me away, and I could tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you listening, uh, if you want to help this continue to go on, you should join up and become a Patreon. And it, it be, would be very much appreciated if you did that. Uh, and we'll have people on like Karen, although you're, you're one of my stars. I got I to gotta tell you that. But look, at what I'm doing is this and what everybody is doing. It can be summarized in this little analogy I heard maybe about 20 years ago. And it's this. Sometimes you think you're not getting anywhere, but here, listen, you thump and thump the ketchup bottle. First, none will come, then a lot will. <laughs> and if you just continue on and persist, we're going to make some changes. And I welcome all of you to help in this endeavor. I, my producer is trying to get my attention here. Go I on. do. Yeah, I do have one thing, Ron. Um, so the videos lately, uh, Scientology is uh caught wind of the videos and they are downvoting on average it's like three to four hundred uh downvotes per video so uh a couple of things so a i mean you know we got their attention they're listening yeah they're forced to listen but b for those that are uh supporting the show if you just even like and upvote the video that really helps us um, and then if you, you know, Ron goes live every Sunday, uh, and if you subscribe and hit the bell next to the subscribe button, you will get notified when he goes live. But I just wanted to point that out that, you know, that is kind of, you know, part of their fair game policy and their tactics is to go in and, and, you know, when you see a video that has four or 500 down votes versus 200 up votes, it makes it look like it's a poor quality video. So, um, that's part of their tactics well that's the church's mental midgets who are doing that though right Correct. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. anyway uh, again i invite you to become a patreon and join us in this endeavor uh, your participation is very much appreciated I, I can't i can't tell you enough go on karen i'm going to become a patron after i'm going to uh, i really appreciate that and you're a sweetheart and uh listen i stayed with them uh when i did the joe rogan show and great hosts and her husband jeffrey just wonderful guy and they got some great dogs and she's had his she is a a place where she takes in birds and especially sick birds and nurses them back to health and this is a true humanitarian this is a person who has compassion for other living entities in which uh, the church is absolutely absent in that particular quality of life okay without going any further on i want to thank you very much for karen coming on karen and uh, i'd love to have you back and we will set it up uh, off the air. Meanwhile, for all of you who are who have watched this, I am Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology. See you Bye -bye. on the next episode.